Welcome to Tales of Marketing Transformation, laying firm foundations for your marketing journey. Tune out all the black magic and imagine a time where marketing has transformed into something human. Where marketing is about building relationships with people you serve. Where marketing is about helping people. That time is now. This is Tales of Marketing Transformation. And here's your host, internationally recognized marketer, speaker, and podcaster, Dr. Jürgen Strauss. Hi, it's Jürgen, and it's time to continue our quest to make marketing human again. Thanks for spending your time and attention with me right now. In the last episode, I shared with you the story of my almonds and our visiting parrots. It reminded me of the idea of understanding your ideal client and what is unique to them, so that you can attract more of your ideal clients to your business. Building a deeper understanding of your ideal client and your target market is core to good human marketing. Did you know that marketing is not just a department or a function within your business, but it is a journey, a journey that you guide your ideal client through as they progress from the stage of who are you through to know you, through to like you, and then to trust you. That, in a nutshell, is the marketing journey your customer's journey. Some also refer to this as a marketing funnel. Today's episode is brought to you by the Transformational Marketing Hub, where you'll find a host of free and exceptionally useful information to help you transform your marketing. You can access the Transformational Marketing Hub through the link at talesofmarketingtransformation.com. If you don't yet have an account for the Hub, Don't worry, just click on the blue Take a Peek Inside button. Go check it out. Are you confused by the complex nature of marketing funnels? You've probably heard of them and read a lot of information describing details of the steps of a marketing funnel and all the nuts and bolts of setting them up within automated systems. Pretty complex, isn't it? At a structural level, a marketing funnel is just a way of breaking down the customer journey from discovering you all the way through a series of steps to when they decide to buy your product or your service. And if we understand that structure, we can apply this to our relationships and focus on making marketing human rather than than on the nuts and bolts of the tools people use to automate marketing funnels. On today's episode, I'm going to talk about the structure of marketing funnels. Of course, it wouldn't be tales of if there wasn't a story involved. So here is today's story. This is Tales of Marketing Transformation. Once upon a time... In a beautiful valley at the base of a spectacular mountain range, there lived a small group of people called the Arnets. Life was really wonderful ever since they'd made peace centuries back with their neighbours on the other side of the mountain range, the Bagwats. There was sunshine, warmth and plentiful food as the crops flourished and the animals thrived. Little Arnico had only known those happy times. She dreamed of becoming a famous opera singer when she grew up and took every opportunity to sing and perform for others. Unfortunately, most of the Arnettes, including her parents and grandparents, hated opera, found her singing obnoxious and discouraged her from doing it. Nevertheless, 
Aniko didn't allow herself to be discouraged and longed for the day she might meet the famous singing teacher Vena, who lived in Bagwat on the other side of the mountain. The Bagwats loved opera. All in all, Aniko was a happy child. Then, one day at the regular meeting of the Arnett Tribal Council, the village elders noted that the crops were showing disturbing signs. Many were dying, and if nothing was done to prevent this, there would soon be a food shortage. They commissioned the scientist Dr Ag to investigate the possible cause and recommend what could be done. Now, Dr Ag was a recluse and lived at the edge of the village. He was a little strange. He loved opera and singing, much to the annoyance of the other villagers. Because Aniko shared a love of opera with Dr Ag, and despite the fact that she hadn't yet met him, the village council asked her to visit Dr Ag and ask for his help. She agreed. She ventured to the edge of the village and found the old man on the porch of his house, singing merrily at the top of his voice. Arnico was immediately at ease and, after greeting Dr Ag, explained the situation with the crops and the villagers need for his help. He agreed to help on the condition that Arnico assist in his research and at the same time sing together with him. Now, of course, she loved the idea of an appreciative audience. It was something that she really hadn't experienced in Arnett. So she agreed to help Dr. Ag. After several weeks of intensive research and a lot of opera singing, they determined that the cause of the crop dying was a lack of water flowing down the mountains from the reservoir, which the village shared with the Bagwats. Now, Dr Ag knew that there had been plenty of snow in the mountains this past winter and that the dam should be full, so he suspected that the Bagwats must have cut the water supply to the Arnett's village. Dr. Ag and Arnico reported their finding to the tribal council and Dr. Ag shared his suspicion that the Bagwats had cut the water supply. The tribal chief determined that they must immediately send a delegation to the other side of the mountain to ask the Bagwats to restore the water supply to the Arnett's village. The three bravest and strongest mountain trekkers, Hu, Du and Lu, were ordered to set out the next morning and travel to Bagwat to petition them to restore the water supply to Arnett. Now, none of the three trekkers spoke Bagwat. In fact, the only person in the village who spoke Bagwat was Dr Ag, who had lived with the Bagwats for many years. In fact, that's where he developed his love of opera. He had lived with them, that is, until his interest in the Bagwat princess was deemed inappropriate by the then king, who promptly expelled him. So when the Arnett Council ordered Dr Ag to join Hu, Du and Lu on the expedition to Bagwat, as the only person who could speak the language, Dr Ag reminded them that he probably wouldn't be welcome in Bagwat, and he'd only go if accompanied by young Arnico. The little girl, the council elders asked, surprised. Trust me, replied Dr Ag. So, the council elders agreed and ordered Arnico to join the other four on the expedition to Bagwat. Arnico was shocked. She didn't want to leave the happy village. She didn't want to leave her parents and grandparents. No way, she said. 
So Hugh, Do, and Lou and a reluctant Dr. Ag went home to prepare and rest before setting off the next morning across the mountains to Bagwat. Arniko was intrigued. Why would Dr. Ag want her to come on this dangerous expedition? What could she possibly do to help? She walked to the edge of the village to Dr. Ag's house, and they talked. Or rather, they sang opera arias together. Finally, Arniko asked Dr. Ag why he had asked for her to join the expedition. Dr. Ag gave the same answer as before. Trust me. Then he added, You want to meet Vayner, don't you? Just the thought of a meeting with the famous opera teacher sent Arniko's heart racing and her head spinning. I would have looked after you, you know, little Arniko, Dr. Ag assured her, but he didn't try to change her mind. The next morning, at the crack of dawn, Hu, Du and Lou set out with Dr. Ag on their treacherous expedition. They would have to scale tall cliffs, cross fragile ice fields, avoid avalanches and most dangerous of all, avoid being eaten by the cave monster that lived in a cave on the peak of the mountain, the very monster that prevented regular travel between Arnett and Bagwat. Just as the party of four were setting out, the small figure of Arniko, wearing a backpack and carrying trekking sticks, came running out from the village. Wait for me, she called. Dr. Ag was overjoyed. Who, a grumpy fellow, said, I'm not going to wait for her. She either keeps up or we leave her. Do and Lou were more relaxed, but sceptical nevertheless. The less. As long as Dr. Ag takes care of her, we're fine. So the intrepid five set off up the mountain headed for Bagwat. They walked and walked for hours before coming to a series of sheer cliff faces they'd have to scale. Hurry up, huffed who. We need to be over these before dark. We can't wait for anyone. The three trackers had no trouble in climbing the cliff faces. Dr. Ag, although old, was fit and also an experienced trekker. Little Arnico struggled, nearly lost her grip a few times. But with Dr. Ag's help, she too reached the top of the cliffs by nightfall. On the next day, they had to traverse the big glacier and ice field. Walking was treacherous as they all struggled to keep their footing. At one point, little Arnico slipped and fell into a crack in the ice. Leave her, bellowed Who. She's holding us back. But Dr. Ag refused to leave Arnico and climbed into the ice crack to help. Eventually, with the help of Who, Do and Lou, both Dr. Ag and Arniko were pulled out of the ravine to safety. Stay close to me, commanded Hu to Arniko, so you don't get into any more trouble. They reached the other side of the ice fields without further mishap by nightfall. On the next day, they began the trek through the mountain pass that would take them past the cave of the monster and then on to the gradual descent into the Bagwat Valley. They were making really good progress and Arnika was cheerful as who had not yelled at her once today and she was finding it easy to keep up with the others. Soon they came to a forest. The trees seemed to get taller and taller the further they got into the forest and it became darker and darker. Suddenly, from a cave beside the forest, there came an almighty roar and there in front of them was a huge, fire-breathing, dragon-like creature, the cave monster. Run, yelled Do, 
But the monster was too quick and he stood on top of Hu, Du and Lu and Dr. Ag, burying them all in the snow. The monster approached Arnico, who had been left a little behind, with his fire-spouting nose. She was frozen with fear. Somewhere, she heard the voice of Dr. Ag call, Sing. And she did. She sang the most beautiful soprano aria, first softly, then louder as she became more confident and more self-assured. The monster stopped, sat down and listened. There was no more fire coming from its nostrils. In fact, there were tears streaming down its cheeks as it listened to the beautiful tones of Arnico's aria. In the meantime, Dr. Ag and the trekkers had freed themselves from the snow and quickly made their way to the edge of the forest where the descent to Bagwat began. Keep singing, but slowly come after us, said Dr. Egg to Arnico. Unfortunately, Arnico had already finished her aria and had stopped singing. The monster looked down at Arnico, put his big hairy paw on her head and grumbled, Thank you, little girl. That was so beautiful. I will cherish your gift. You and your friends may pass safely. Dr. Ag and the three trekkers waited for Arnico in a clearing. Who was amazed and said, Well, it's about time the little girl pulled her weight. Dr. Ag couldn't help feeling just a little bit proud. The feeling didn't last long, though, as they were suddenly surrounded by a patrol troop of Bagwats. Who are you and what is your business here? And how did you get past the monster, they demanded to know. We are from Arnett and have a message to deliver to your king, answered Dr. Ag in his best Bagwat. No one speaks to our king. Not even we Bagwats may do that. You must be spies or terrorists. And with that, the four were put in chains and dragged away. Are there any more of you? asked the patrol commander. Dr. Ag replied, We are but four adults. And with that, they were marched off down the hill and promptly deposited in a Bagwat jail cell. Arnico had almost caught up to her friends when they were arrested by the patrol and she'd watched events from a hiding place behind a rock. After they all left, she sat there and began crying. She was now all alone in a strange place. She didn't know what to do. She was afraid. Aniko began humming a tune to herself to calm her fears. Soon, she started singing again, softly at first, then louder as she relaxed. Suddenly, she heard a voice behind her. Who is this making such beautiful music? she turned to see a tall, striking figure of a man with a very resonant voice that she found quite friendly. I am Arnico of Arnett and I came here with my friends who have a message to deliver to your king. She told him about the arrest of her friends and said that if she could speak with the king and explain that her friends meant no harm, perhaps he would release them and receive their message. Now, it was lucky for Arnico that the stranger spoke Arnett. He told her that no one may speak to the king unless they are on the royal council. In fact, if someone breaks that law, the penalty is death. But I have a way you might be able to free your friends. The king and queen love opera, and every morning my students perform for them. Singing for the king is okay. You just may not speak to him. Tomorrow, if you wish, you may join our performance. Arnico was thrilled. Who are you, kind sir? She asked the stranger. They call me Vayner, 
he replied. Arnica was speechless. The famous Vayner, the one she had dreamt of meeting ever since she'd heard of him, was right there before her. Vayner kindly allowed Arnica to stay at his house that night and the next morning she joined the opera performance in the royal palace. The king and queen were seated on their thrones on a platform and the performers sang from the floor in front of them. One performance followed another and there was dignified applause for each from the royal couple. Vayner signalled to Arnico that it was her turn. Remember, you must not speak, he reminded her. Arnico stood on the floor in front of the king and queen and was stuck. What to do? How to rescue her friends? Suddenly she spoke. Majesty, my friends are in your jail and need to deliver a message to you. She was cut off mid-sentence by the guards who pounced on her and dragged her off into a corner. Vayner came over. He was furious. I told you not to speak. You'll now be sentenced to death and you've also got me in trouble. Arnico watched Vayner approach the royal couple. Apparently he was on the royal council. After a lengthy discussion, Vayner returned and told Arnico that he'd negotiated a last chance for her. She would be able to sing for the king and queen, and if she moved them both to tears, then, and only then, would she and her friends be spared. If not, well, that might be the end of the story. And don't speak. Well, no pressure, right? Arnico stepped onto the singing floor, nervous and full of doubt. Then she thought about her villagers and their critical food shortage. She thought about Dr. Ag and the trekkers in jail. She thought about the encounter with the monster. And she heard again Dr. Ag's voice in her head, Sing. And she sang. She sang the most beautiful the most sonorous, sweet and melodious, at the same time sad and soulful aria you could possibly imagine. She sang about a beautiful village at the base of the mountains. She sang about a tragic shortage of water that was leading to starvation of its inhabitants and impending death among the children. She sang of the five intrepid trekkers who made their way across the mountains to the neighbouring village to ask for help. She sang of the fearsome monster and how they befriended it. And she sang about the four trekkers who were captured and in prison. She looked at the king and saw tears streaming down his face. She saw the queen sobbing uncontrollably as she squeezed her consort's hand. Arnico stopped singing. Wait, what happens next? How does the story end? The king wanted to know. Arnico almost spoke an answer, but just remembered that law and then sang in her very best operatic voice, I don't know what happens next. You, Majesty, have the power to write the ending to the story. It is you who can free my friends. It is you who can restore the water supply to my village and save them. And it is you that can allow me to stay in Bagwat to study opera with Maestro Vayner. The Queen leant across and whispered in the King's ear, the king stood up and everyone bowed. The girl is pardoned, he commanded. Free her friends from jail and bring them here and immediately restore the water flow to Arnett. Once he sat down, people scurried off in all directions to carry out his commands. Vayner took Arnico aside and said, So you want to study opera with me? It's what I've dreamed of all my life, she replied. I'm just sad that my village 
doesn't like opera, except Dr. Egg, of course. What Vayner said next astounded Arnico. Perhaps I can come with you and live in Arnett for a while and teach you there and help you educate the villagers about the beauty and the power of opera. Arnico was beside herself with joy, and her feelings were even stronger when she was reunited with her friends who had been brought to the palace. They hugged and laughed, and she and Dr. Ag sang joyfully. Even Gruff Who was happy and kind to Arnico, as they had all heard how she had secured their release and the restoration of the water to Arnett. The next morning, they set off on the return journey to Arnett. They were farewelled by the entire royal party, a guard of honour and all the opera singers. Arnico performed one more time for the royal couple, telling the story of a kind and benevolent king who did good for all his peoples and his neighbours. Their party was now six. As promised, Vena came to live in Arnett and tutor Arnico. As they headed off, who said to Arnico, You've done enough, little girl. Jump on my shoulders. You don't need to walk. And he carried her all the way back to Arnett. When they reached the monster cave, Arnico sang another beautiful ario. And the monster came out to listen and waved as the trekkers passed safely by. After a few days, they returned to Arnett to a hero's welcome. Of course, the village already knew that the mission was a success as the water was again flowing and the crops were recovering. They put on a huge celebration and invited Hugh, as the expedition leader, to speak. Hugh said that he was pleased to be home and that the water had been restored. He pointed out that it was Arnico and her singing that had made the mission successful and he asked the villagers to listen to Arnico singing because not only was opera really beautiful, it had the power to change lives. And with that, Arnico proceeded to sing the story of the entire expedition, the trials of the trek, the fall into the crevice, and the encounter with the monster. When she got to the part about the arrest of the adults, Dr. Ag joined the singing. Vayner also joined in at the part where he first met Arnico. The villagers were truly moved and, of course, very appreciative of the efforts of all the team. When the singing had finished, there was thunderous applause and cheering. Arnico's parents and grandparents beamed with pride and hugged their little hero. That was the most beautiful thing I have ever heard, said her father. Such a precious gift. A marketing funnel is essentially a customer journey where your customer is the hero and you are their guide. The high-level structure of a marketing funnel is, first, no. Your target market learns about you and about your product or service. Secondly, like. By providing exceptionally useful and relevant information to your ideal prospect, you build a relationship with them and you nurture that relationship. And thirdly, trust. Your ideal clients see that you understand their needs you are positioned to help them and have already provided great value. They're now ready to buy from you. Of course, you must earn this trust and continue to build that relationship. And when you transform their experience, you'll transform your marketing. Right at this moment, there are people in the world who are in need of the gifts, of the talents, of the wisdom and know-how that only you can provide them. There are people whose lives will be completely transformed if they have the opportunity to work with you. Therefore, you have the responsibility to both grow your business in an authentic, human and sustainable way so that those people 
don't miss that opportunity. And you must competently promote what you do and what you sell. If you head on over to the show notes for today's episode at www.talesofmarketingtransformation.com, you can get access to today's resource, which is the Transformational Marketing Journey and Map. You can use this to expand the high-level marketing funnel structure and help you guide your customers on their journey. This has made a big difference to my business. It basically transformed my marketing. So head on over to the episode show notes and get your copy. This is Tales of Marketing Transformation. Help share Tales of Marketing Transformation with others by reviewing the podcast at www.talesofmarketingtransformation.com and join the conversation in the Facebook group. If you'd like to chat to me directly to give feedback on this podcast, to ask questions about marketing or anything else really, click the calendar link in the episode show notes to schedule a short call. I look forward to chatting with you. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Tune in again next week when I'll talk about marketing success principles and share another story with you. In the meantime, stay awesome and let's make marketing human again. Thanks for coming on this journey with Tales of Marketing Transformation. Join us next week for another fabulous episode. For episode resources, visit www.talesofmarketingtransformation.com. Stay connected by subscribing at talesofmarketingtransformation.com forward slash subscribe.